My presentation gives a brief introduction to probabilistic programming, which is an important subdomain of stochastic optimization and in general of optimization problems under uncertainty. And it addresses uh, questions of how to deal with inequality constraints, which are subject to random perturbations, and how to find an optimal design under keeping the probability of satisfying these inequalities high enough. So this, uh, this model of stochastic optimization is very important in engineering ap applications, uh, first of all in power management, but also in PD PDE constraint optimization under random state constraints. In order to algorithmically deal with such problems, one has to know some uh, important analytical properties of the uh, probability function uh, arising in this problem in these problems which assigns to each decision the probability of uh, satisfying the given random constraints and the talk presents some result how to how to get nice properties of this probability function like convexity continuity differentiability given the corresponding properties of the input data and finally the talk uh, demonstrates the application of the presented results to problems from water reservoir uh, management or uh, gas network optimization under uncertain random loads. Well, uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for coming to our seminar in uh, the PhD program uh, on statistics optimization in applied mathematics. Uh, today, uh, I have the great pleasure to introduce Professor René Andrion from the Biostars Institute for Applied Analysis and Stochastics in Berlin. Uh, well, we know you several, uh, from several years ago, we are authors, and uh, for those that uh, may uh, not know him, I uh, will give just some uh, numbers. Uh, if you look uh, in Maxinet, you find 75 papers, but if you look in the web page, you find uh, 100 papers, more or less, and uh, 800, more than 800 sites by uh, around 400 authors. And uh, he's editor uh, in, uh, currently uh, in uh, SIOT, Math Programming, Separate Analysis, Jota, um, optimization, so um, uh, many uh, very reputed uh, journals in our field. And his uh, fields of interest are on the one high, high uh, nonlinear programming, stochastic programming, and uh, also parametric uh, optimization and semi programming, uh, multivariate uh, data analysis also. And uh, what well, I think uh, it's uh, uh, just to, to have an idea of the quality of, of the speaker. So it's uh, our great pleasure to have you here, and we are yours. Thank you very much, Juan, for this very kind in introduction. It is a particular pleasure for me to be again here uh, in, at Elche University to continue our cooperation with Juan, uh, Lola and many other colleagues and uh, in particular also to have the opportunity to present a, a talk here which will be a brief and gentle introduction to probabilistic programming with some motivation, some mathematical results and applications. So to start with let me first uh, introduce the model I want to consider. Uh, we start with a uh, stochastic inequality system as described here by this uh, set of inequalities g of x, psi and t larger than zero. Here the small t plays the role of an index coming from the index set capital T, could be finite or infinite, we don't specify it at the moment. Xi is an n-dimensional random vector and x is a certain decision variable from a, a Banach space. So think, for instance, uh, of, uh, of an inequality system describing the stability of a mechanical construction like a bridge. 
So we want to find the cost optimal design of this bridge, which is coded, encoded by X. But the bridge is also affected by, after we built it, by a random uh, forces. So there's a random parameter Xi um, having an impact on the stability of the bridge. And let's say the bridge uh, is, is stable and, uh, um, and fine as long as this inequality system is satisfied. Now the problem is uh, you build the bridge here and now, the design, you des decide on the design of the bridge right now, but once you have uh, constructed it, it will be uh, affected by uh, different random forces uh, uh, of, of different nature and you don't know exactly what, what uh, the realizations of these random forces will be. So no, no matter how you design your bridge, there will be all, always a risk uh, that it collapses in principle because there's a possibility of extreme events for the random forces. And um, that is why uh, in engineering it has become very popular to, to uh, declare a, a decision vector x to be feasible whenever the probability of satisfying the given inequality system is larger than a, a specified uh, level little p, for instance. The bridge is safe, let's say, with the probability 99.999%. Yeah. So in this way, uh, you define or you introduce a probability function which assigns to your decision the probability of satisfying the given stochastic inequality system. And uh, probability functions occur in many optimization problems from engineering. For instance, in reliability maximization, where you try to find a design uh, which maximizes uh, the safety uh, uh, of this design under some additional deterministic constraints. But you could also use the probability function in the context of a constraint of such an inequality constraints as I mentioned before where you require the construction to be to 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 satisfy a certain given pre-specified level little p and then we talk about about a probabilistic constraint here note that from the abstract point of view such a probabilistic constraint is just a conventional inequality as you know it from uh, classical optimization problems all the difficulties are uh, hidden in the fact that you do not have access in general to an explicit formula evaluating phi as a function of x. So it's given as a probability, could be multivariate integral and so on. There are in general no closed form analytical formulae for phi and much less for let's say gradients of phi if it comes to numerically uh, solve such uh, problems. And this is the challenge in probabilistic programming to infer uh, desired uh, analytical properties of uh, small phi like continuity, differentiability, convexity, things like that from corresponding properties of the input data. And what are the input data here? On the one hand it is the mapping G defining the inequality and uh, second it is the distribution of the random vector Xi. So there, for, for these two ingredients of the problem you have a chance uh, to, to, to have information and from those you would like to derive corresponding uh, nice properties uh, of phi. And I want to um, sketch in my talk uh, some ideas how this transition from the properties uh, of G or of the distribution of Xi to the properties of uh, phi can be realized. Um, before doing so let me introduce a small uh, applied problem which falls into the class I introduced before. We consider a, a water reservoir, as it is sketched here, um, uh, for which we, uh, to which we apply a, a controlled release policy X of T over a given time interval from zero to capital T, and which at the other hand um, is influenced by, random infl by a random inflow process Psi of T. Um, think of the owner of such a reservoir, like Electricité de France in, in, in France, uh, who would like to withdraw water from the reservoir to turbine it in order to produce energy and, uh, for instance, sell it on the market or whatsoever to, to make a certain profit. Um, for instance, on a day ahead market, 
we would have to decide right now on the withdrawal profile, on the amount of water we withdraw for, for each of the 24 hours of tomorrow. So we offer it to the market today, but we apply this policy only tomorrow, this release policy producing energy. And the problem is, of course, we do not know what will be the inflow process tomorrow to this reservoir. And this fact makes the level uh, inside the reservoir random, but usually you, you have the intention to keep it between certain critical lower and upper uh, levels due to uh, keeping a reserve for floods or for technical or ecological reasons. There are many reasons for that, but uh, note that the level itself uh, is random. So when we decide today about an optimal release policy, which makes us money if you want so, um, at the same time we cannot um, uh, guarantee at absolute safety that the level will not um, uh, violate some of these uh, limits. All we can hope for is that given historical data and statistical uh, information about the inflow process, we can keep the level between these uh, critical limits uh, with a sufficiently high probability. And uh, if, you, uh, if you do so uh, in more detail, first uh, I want to come back to my previous assumption that Xi is an n-dimensional uh, random vector. Uh, this means that I will not consider Xi to be a genuine stochastic process, but I will assume, uh, using for instance some Kaun luev expansion, that this stochastic process can be represented as a finitely weighted uh, uh, sum of determin deterministic uh, processes where the weights are random. So this is a random vector now, a finite dimensional. And uh, in this way we, we uh, fall into the class of problems I uh, introduced before. And then the water level at time t is clearly uh, representable as the initial water level plus uh, the uh, accumulated amount of water uh, going into the reservoir from zero to uh, little t minus uh, the cumulative amount of water we, we re released in the same uh, time interval. And then we can write the probability of satisfying the given critical level uh, for the given critical levels when applying the release profile x uh, as written down here, and we arrive at this probability function assigning to our release policy the probability of keeping this level in, in, uh, inside the given limits for all times uh, in, the, in the time horizon uh, or in the time interval zero capital T. And uh, what could be an optimization problem behind this? Uh, usually you are given some uh, price profile, time-dependent time price profile. So you have some idea what the prices on, on the next time will be depending on time. And of course you would like to, to maximize the profit uh, um, you achieve by applying this uh, release policy, which is then the integral of price times uh, amount of water released or turbine. Um, subject to this probabilistic constraint. And here you see already that indeed the inequality system is, an, is a semi-infinite one because uh, we have uh, for, for each time uh, in this whole interval we, we have a, a different uh, inequality to be satisfied. But I want to illustrate um, uh, the, the, well, the meaning of probabilistic constraints uh, in the context of a water reservoir uh, optimization. This is an uh, example we considered together with some French colleagues from Electricité de France. Uh, um, this is a, a, um, a network of water reservoirs from the French Alps, six reservoirs, which means, which means we have six turbines and the reservoirs are interconnected. We uh, assume a certain, a, cer a certain price signal, which is given here in gray color. The considered time horizon is, um, is um, two days. It's 20, uh, 24 um, time intervals uh, with two hours uh, in a discretization of two hours each. And uh, in, in the ideal ca case, 
you would like to, to follow with your release policy the given price signal in some sense to, 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 to maximize your profit. But you cannot do it uh, uh, in an arbitrary way because you have to keep the levels uh, between the given limits. So this gives a constraint and as you can see here, uh, this is the solution when applying probabilistic constraints for the level at, uh, at a safety um, level of 98%. Then these six profiles for turbining more or less try to, to follow this uh, sinoid, sino, sinoidal uh, shape of the price profile, but they cannot do so perfectly. And they have some, sometimes to deviate from the ideal, from the ideal shape in order to keep uh, the the level in, inside and um, when you apply these release strategies to the reservoirs, to the six reservoirs, then you can make an a posteriori check. How would it apply to a simulated inflow profiles? It's like making the check of a solution when solving a linear uh, system of equations. So we, we generate 100 Given, given the statistical uh, distribution, which is a multivariate Gaussian ones with according correlations and so on and so on, we, we simulate 100 uh, inflow profiles to the reservoir and apply these release strategies and have a look at the reservoir, what, what is, how is the level evolving. This is just an a posteriori check. We are not using these 100 uh, simulations to solve the optimization problem, not to confuse this. And uh, it turns out when we apply these uh, uh, release strategies to these 100 inflow profiles, then uh, actually all 100 um, uh, scenarios of, of level, uh, of reservoir levels depending on time, uh, satisfy the given limits. Well, this is uh, by chance that all 100 satisfy these levels. What we could expect is uh, 98, uh, 98 approximately should satisfy. There could be uh, slight deviations due to uh, randomness in the, in the sim simulation. So it's a very stable, it's a very stable solution. You could um, uh, ask yourself why considering uh, complicated probabilistic constraints because I have to solve, I have to deal with these constraints algorithmically. What would happen if I just ignore more or less the stochastics of, of the inflow process and reduce things to expected values? I just take the expected, the, the mean inflow process and solve this problem. And then, which is very easy, so in a discrete setting it, it reduces the whole thing to a linear program. There's no challenge in solving it. And then you uh, obtain these solutions here, which, which look not so different from the, from the other ones, but have a look at this peak here, which is not present here. Have a look at this peak here, which is not present here, and some other details. This is quite close, and the profit you make is slightly higher than in the case of applying probabilistic constraints approximately 2%, um, which is not surprising because you have to pay a price for safety. But the price, the price you pay is not, uh, not very significant. But the effect is uh, quite uh, dramatic if now you apply these uh, release profiles to the same given inflow pro profiles, then you see that there are many violations of, of the given limits uh, at, uh, at different times over the time horizon. So for instance here and here, uh, half of the scenarios violate the limits. But it's even worse if you count the number of scenarios which stay between the limits over the whole time horizon, then it is zero. Because those which are violating here may satisfy here, those satisfying here may violate, violate there. And so it is a completely uh, non-robust uh, uh, um, decision which you take here uh, and you could replace it by a very robust uh, situation uh, just by um, uh, just by paying a, a small price for it. And this is uh, somehow the idea behind probabilistic constraints and here's just another uh, application which is related with PDE constraint optimization. So this is a, a quite simple partial differential equation as it appears in uh, shape optimization of mechanical structures or um, crystal growth. Um, 
here uh, um, a y is a state variable, u is a control you apply on the right hand side on the boundary of a certain domain and uh, in this equation the right hand side is given by a random ter term, it could be random forces acting on a on a wind turbine for instance and you try to find the optimal shape of a wind turbine uh, such that the stresses um, um, uh, resulting from the random forces um, stay in, in certain limits with high probability. So the, the, the randomness of the right hand side um, enforces or entails a randomness of the, of the state variable and if, if your aim is to keep the state variable uh, inside certain limits um, over the whole uh, domain then you end up at a probabilistic constraint with an infinite number of random inequalities inside and the usual way to deal with it is to apply the control to state operator to make the state constraints into constraints on the on the control on the decision variable this is again the classical form of a chance constraint and this kind of um, uh, probabilistic optimization problems is gaining a lot of interest in recent times although its algorithmic solution is still in its infancy. Now let me come to some uh, more mathematical results in my talk. As I promised I wanted to give a certain sketch how we can infer from uh, properties of the given inequality system to properties of the a function of the probability function assigning to a decision the probability of satisfying the system. We um, put ourselves into the setting of a Banner space and uh, then our first interest is uh, weak continuity. So we are interested in, in uh, characterizing the weak sequential upper semi-continuity of the probability function and all we need to, to, to get it is a weak sequential upper semi-continuity of this given G which we can analyze directly in the first argument in the decision. And then no matter what, what the quality uh, with respect to the other variables is and no matter what the index set, set is, can be completely arbitrary, and no matter what the distribution of the random vector is, uh, we, we get the desired result for the probability function. And as a consequence, of course, the set of feasible decisions by probabilistic constraint, which is the upper level set of this probability function, with respect to the safety level is then weakly sequentially closed and this is what you would need uh, along with standard assumptions in PDE constraint optimization to ensure uh, existence of solutions when the objective is convex for instance and so on. And now you could uh, uh, switch to the compl com complementary a property of lower sequential semi-continuity of phi and this is a, a bit more subtle uh, you, you of course you need the corresponding property of the given G as before for the upper semi-continuity but it's not sufficient what, what would you have to add first the index set T uh, is no longer allowed to be arbitrary but uh, has to be compact uh, compact subset, subset of some uh, finite dimensional space you have to assume that Xi has a density. Here it could be even a discrete random vector in the first result. And finally uh, you, you would be interested in, um, in uh, okay, what is missing? Ah, what, what is missing here is uh, we, we have to add a concavity of G in the random vector. And then the last assumption you have to impose is kind of Slater assumption for a, for a, uh, for a given X you uh, ask for a, a Z bar such that this infinite uh, inequality system is strictly uh, satisfied for all, for all indices. And under these conditions uh, the probability function is weakly sequentially lower semi-continuous and you can combine the, the assumptions of both propos propositions to show a weak, uh, weak um, continuity of the probability function phi. And another uh, property of interest is of course convexity of the feasible set. This is a difficult uh, uh, issue in probabilistic programming and in general you cannot uh, expect convexity even, even for nice input data. But there's some 
a fundamental theorem by Prekopa, which was formulated uh, in, in finite dimensions and, and for finite index sets. But if you review the proof, then you can see there's no finite dimensional argument. And also, the, the, the index set could be infinite without um, drastically changing the proof. And then the result uh, you get for convexity of the set of feasible decisions here is as follows. If, ja, if G is uh, quasi-concave, and the first two variables simultaneously for any index t. And if Xi has a log concave density, a density whose log is concave, like Gaussian density and many other prominent multivariate uh, densities, then the probabilistic constraints def de constraint defines a convex set for no matter which uh, probability level p. This, uh, these uh, results you can directly apply to this kind of simple PDEs to derive uh, uh, existence and convexity uh, of PDE constraint problems subject to state uh, to, to stochastic state uh, constraints. Now, of course, the maybe the most interesting property of probability functions would be differentiability because uh, if we, I, I, I go back to the optimization problem in, the, in its abstract form. If we want to solve this, then usually we would like to apply methods exploiting at least first order information like a gradient of the objective, which is no problem in general, but gradient of the probability function is a crucial issue here. And uh, a good working horse to analyze differentiability and also to implement algorithmic approaches uh, in the case of Gaussian and Gaussian-like distributions is the so-called spheric radial decomposition of a Gaussian random vector. Let me briefly sketch the idea. We assume that without, of uh, without loss of generality, our random vector has a, has a standardized uh, Gaussian distribution with mean zero and correlation matrix R, uh, which decomposes, let's say, into Koleski factors L, L transposed. Then it is well known that the probability of this random vector to take values or to fall into a, a given Borel measurable subset M can be represented as a spherical integral, which means as an integral uh, over the uniform distribution uh, on the sphere. And uh, the integrand is uh, colored in red. Yeah, I explain it right now. Um, maybe the best way to do it is this picture. Uh, we fix a direction on the sphere V, then we transform it to LV using this Koleski dis decomposition. This is in order to take into account correlation. So if, if, if the random vector would have independent components, then L is just the identity and you keep the V, but if there are correlations, then you uh, change uh, V to LV and this gives a new direction. And then now you, you shoot into this new direction and you have a look at the intersection of the ray with the given set M, this red intersection here. This is a one-dimensional set. In general, it can be, uh, can, can be complicated, but when we have some convexity, it's kind of interval. And uh, here you have now to uh, calculate the one-dimensional chi probability of this uh, intersection chi distribution with m degrees of freedom if your random vector is m dimensional and this is this is once you once you know for instance the uh, uh, the the initial and end points of the interval this is no no difficulty because you have highly pre precise numerical approximations of the chi distribution in dim dimension 1 there's no no big deal in calculating this numerically and if you take the integral over all these uh, one-dimensional probabilities, then uh, you recover the integral of the whole set. So it is like scanning a set. You, 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 shoot, you shoot in all directions, maybe even you, you miss the set when it is zero, and, uh, and you add, and you add, so in, in, in particular when it comes to numerical implementation, you would replace this integral by a finite sum, for instance using a large a quasi Monte Carlo sampling of the sphere, and then you add all these one dimensional probabilities, take the average. In this way, um, what is nice, there are two things which are nice. First thing, uh, the integration domain is a, fi is a fixed domain. Um, 
um, when you move your set, you, 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 you change your integrand. This is, this is given here. Imagine now that our set is not fixed, but it is influenced by the decision vector x. So it moves. It is an m of x. And uh, given, given by this infinite uh, inequality system, then the integrand changes, of course. The x enters, enters the definition of the integrand because now uh, for, a, for a perturbed sem, uh, set m of x, uh, the same ray will uh, now hit it uh, in a different way. But the domain of integration uh, is compact. This would be different if you would take just the, the, the brute definition of a probability which is the integral over the density uh, for, for the given set. But when the set moves, uh, then, then uh, the, the domain of integration would move. And uh, this is not, not nice when it comes to sampling and also when it comes to gradients. But here things are nicer and uh, um, we could hope for uh, uh, getting gradients of the probability function assigning to x this probability here by just integrating under the integral uh, sign. And still we would keep the fixed uh, domain of integration. It would not change. So we could sample the sphere in order to update not only the values of the probability but at the same time the gradients. And um, if this would be allowed, and in a moment I will show that it is not in general, then, uh, then the gradient of phi could be represented as the spherical integrand over the partial gradient of this function of this integrand E here, which now depends on, on x, which moves the set, and also on the direction where you, where you hit the set. I want to refer to this function to the, to the radial probability function. And this, this is the one-dimensional probability function which changes with the set and also with the direction, with x and v. Now this interchange of integration and differentiation would be no problem uh, um, as long as the domains we consider here uh, are, uh, are bounded. But usually they are not. And this uh, uh, gives us an alert to be cautious. You cannot simply, uh, 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 even, even, uh, even if the input data are differentiable, you cannot simply uh, assume that the probability function is differentiable. I will uh, come to this uh, right now. Um, I want to consider now a probability functions of, of a uh, formally simpler type, but actually equivalent. Where no more, where the inequality is no longer indexed, but I assume that G is locally Lipschitzian. I will also assume that it is convex in the second variable and locally Lipschitzian in both variables. Now, before we considered an infinite system of inequalities, now I consider just one inequality. But of course, uh, passing to the to uh, for, for an infinite, let's say, differentiable inequality system, passing to the maximum over a compact uh, index set, uh, we arrive exactly at such a single inequality, which now is just locally Lipschitzian. Of course, in the end, we would like to go back to the original. Uh, uh, system, but for the moment it is sufficient to consider just one single inequality here. We fix the point of interest x bar at which we want to differentiate the probability function and we will make a, a Slater point assumption. Uh, actually not just the existence of a Slater point but a slightly more uh, st strict assumption that the mean value of the of the random vector uh, is a Slater point of this inequality. The vector of the distribution, maybe a 90% confidence level could look like that. And um, now we will assume that the mean value is an interior point or a Slater point of this uh, convex set when we fix the x bar. Well, this gives one convex set due to convexity in the second argument. And then it uh, even after changing the x in a, in a small neighborhood of x bar, it will uh, stay. Uh, it will remain a Slater point. Huh? What is the advantage now? If we if we shoot, uh, in, uh, this is the sphere now. If we shoot into certain directions, then the intersection will be an interval, either with a with with exactly one exit point, which I want to denote rho. Or if the set is unbounded, maybe an interval which is uh, 
uh, or array which is completely uh, in the set. Uh, so, so without in, in that case, we could interpret rho, rho to be inf uh, infinity, and this rho will depend, of course, uh, on the set which is moving, the inequality which is moving here with x. This is for x bar, and it will also depend on the on the direction we have chosen on the sphere. So it will be a rho of x and v. Now you could uh, ask if this assumption is, is strong, but it turns out if the mean vector mi, mu would not be a slater point of this feasible set, so the, the feasible set mu is outside the feasible set, then by convexity you could uh, separate it from this set and you get a half space not containing mu but the feasible set. And by symmetry of the distribution this half space has to have a probability lower than one half because it does not contain the mean value. On the other hand, in probabilistic programming, we are usually dealing with high probabilities close to one. So it's a not, not a um, very uh, uh, severe restriction. OK, uh, thanks to our previous result, we already know that the Slater point assumption guarantees that our, pro oh, sorry, that our probability function is uh, is, uh, is continuous. Now let us assume for a moment that the given inequality is not locally Lipschitzian but even smooth. Shouldn't we expect that the probability function is smooth as well? Imagine that the, that the inequality defines a half space which now is moving with x in the space and the half space has a Gaussian probability and intuitively you may think uh, the probability of this smoothly uh, moving half space will also change smoothly and this is correct one can show it it's, it's, an, it's an easy exercise however as soon uh, as soon as g is no longer linear in size so we are not talking about half spaces but let's say about convex sets moving this is no longer true and here is an example this is an example for one dimensional decision variable x and two dimensional random vector which has a standard normal distribution it is defined here the capital phi is the one dimensional cumulative gaussian distribution function and you can easily check that this is continuously differentiable. This uh, x part is x square on the, on the positive reals and zero on the negative. So it is C1 and this is smooth. This capital phi, everything is uh, C1 here. And it is also not hard to check that G is convex in the, in the random uh, variables and the components of the random variables uh, thanks to the log concavity of this capital phi. And finally, if we fix the decision x bar equal to zero and we plug in uh, the mean vector uh, zero here, then uh, everything becomes zero here and we have minus one, which is strictly smaller than zero. In other words, Slater point assumption is satisfied. And this implies, actually you can, can, uh, you can um, analytical, uh, analytically uh, um, um, calculate the probability for for this inequality depending on x it gives you these formulae you can plot the function as a, f as a function of the one dimensional x and uh, due to the Slater point assumption um, this has to be continuous and it is. However you see it is not even Lipschitz continuous because the decay here is like a negative square root and much less it is differentiable although the in input data are perfect they are differ continuously differentiable and the Gaussian distribution has uh, all the perfect differentiability properties but this probability assignment is not, not uh, differentiable not even Lipschitz continuous. This means uh, it does not make sense to start with differentiable inequalities here. Let us keep the local Lipschitzian uh, uh, character of the input data and let us accept that we have to expect um, continuous uh, uh, probability functions anyway. And then let us have a look what, uh, what additional conditions to add until we end at, at the desired differentiability because for the moment I cannot see it. And the first direction, uh, first result in this direction is a, from a joint work with Chilean colleagues uh, from Santiago and uh, it provides a kind of interchange of, of uh, uh, differentiation and integration but in the sense of sub-differentiation and, uh, and integration. Now uh, to, to, to get a visual contact with the original question, 
here we asked for this uh, relation. Um, we cannot hope for it because we don't have the differentiability, even if the data are differentiable, but we can ask for the subdifferential and whether we can take the integral over the partial subdifferential. And this we can do using Modohovich subdifferential. Uh, we are uh, for x in a Banner space setting, separable and uh, reflexive Banner space setting. And uh, then we have an upper estimate for the Modohovich subdifferential of the of the probability function by means of first this integral which is in the Aumann sense. It's, an, it's a multi-valued integrand which means you integrate over all measurable selections of this uh, multi-valued uh, part here and collect them to get uh, the set on the right hand side but you also have to subtract a certain dual cone CL star. I will not go into the details here but just in, to give the idea this cone accounts for the mm, for all the troubles from the input data which prevent you from directly interchanging differentiability and, and, and uh, integration. And this, these troubles have to do with certain growth conditions of the in input data. In particular, you have to be able to control the partial derivative of g with respect to x in terms of the z variables in a certain way. If, if this control is not possible, uh, it introduces uh, a certain additional term here which, which uh, makes your formula deviate from the desired result where you just interchange integration and sub-differentiation. Now the idea is um, what can we add to get nicer formulae and of course the idea could be to make this guy disappear which means to assume that C is the whole space so that this vanishes here and C, C to be the whole space can be explicitly written down as, as such a growth condition on the input data. You can really check them. Yeah? And then this term disappears, but even more, you can show in that case uh, the, the probability function is not just continuous, but Lipschitz continuous. And then all which is remaining is this integral, this, uh, this subdifferential, this integral, and this uh, subdifferential here. And if it is Lipschitz continuous, then of course it, it, there's no difference in uh, applying Modohovich or Clark subdifferential be, because some convexification takes part in the integral anyhow. And uh, a Clark subdifferential is convex, close convex uh, hull of Modohovich. And this altogether leads us to the following result that uh, in the case th this cone C is the whole space, we have. Uh, we have uh, this formula until here with Clark's subdifferential. But moreover, in order to apply uh, this result uh, to concrete problems, we have to be able to specify this subdifferential of the radial probability function in terms of the initial data. And this is done here in this uh, theorem. Under this growth condition, which I will not uh, uh, discuss in detail, but let me just mention is almost always satisfied. For instance, if the GI are separable in X and Xi, or if they are polynomial. So you really have to spend some effort, as I did here, in order to invent pathological counterexamples. So this is in general satisfied. Then our probability function is uh, locally Lipschitzian, and we have this uh, upper estimate for the Clark subdifferential which is completely uh, which is completely explicit in the input data because g is given so you can calculate the partial gradient with respect to x and z and this is the one dimensional chi density function which has an explicit formula no no trouble with it all you have to to know is this rho this rho function which i which i have depicted here you you uh, uh, you have to be able for a given uh, direction v and a given x to, uh, to calculate this exit point numerically. For instance, in, in for linear constraints, uh, there's an explicit formula for quadratic one. You would end up at quadratic uh, e equations and so on and so on. Um, in other cases, it, is, it may require more numerical effort, but it is in dimension one. It's, it's quite nice. And also now, this, what I have written down here, is already specified for a finite set of smooth inequalities. So our, our Lipschitzian G is the max of finitely many uh, smooth uh, functions uh, GI. Um, so um, we, we do not have just one inequality here but, but maybe several, several inequalities. 
And then the rho, of course, would be the minimum of the rho which you would assign to, to any of these inequalities. And sometimes, by chance, you may hit a situation where both are binding. And this, uh, defines, this defines an active index set, and in that case you actually have to take the convex hull of all these uh, expressions, which you can calculate uh, explicitly, uh, and, and this gives you this upper estimate. Now, in the final step, we would like to um, end up at a, at a differentiability result. How could we do that? Uh, as far as locally Lipschitzian, the Clark subdifferential is, uh, is non-empty. This is what we know. The left-hand side is non-empty. And uh, to make it differentiable, we, we need to, to make it uh, uh, single-valued. Then, then it would be strictly differentiable and under some additional assumptions continuously differentiable. So how to make it single-valued? It's no, non-empty. And how to make it single-valued? Well, of course, uh, just make the upper estimate single-valued then they have to coincide. And um, uh, in this case, uh, it is, it is a, a differentiable function, phi, and you have a, actually equality in these formulae. How to make, how to make the, the, the upper estimate single-valued? Um, make, make this integrand, this multi-valued integrand, single-valued almost everywhere. That means you have to make sure that for almost all directions on the sphere, uh, this set here, the set of active indices, is, is a singleton for almost all. So there may be some directions where you, where you hit two of them, but uh, th these are singular directions. Okay, this is hard to check because it concerns the uniform measure on the sphere and how to, how to check this is difficult. We, we were able to reduce all this to a, to a classical constraint qualification, which you can verify. And this is the so-called uh, rank 2 constraint qualification. Uh, at, at any fixed point x bar, uh, you, you require all active uh, gradients, the set of active gradients to have, uh, okay, for, for each s selection of, of couples of active gradients, you require that they are um, independent, linearly independent. So this is weaker than linear independence. Think of a pyramid for four faces meeting in one point, the grade active gradients in the, in the vertex of the pyramid ca cannot be linearly independent because there are four of them in dimension three, but any two of them are linearly independent. Huh? And once this is given, you can uh, derive the differentiability, the desired differentiability of the probability function, and you get uh, exactly by specifying this expression to a, to a singleton, you get an explicit characterization uh, of the gradient, and so you can use the same sampling scheme on the sphere in order to update values and gradients of the probability function, as you can apply, for instance, in a simple setting, kind of uh, um, projected gradient method for a numerical solution. So I'm close to the, to the end of my talk. Uh, the idea originally was now, in the end, to present some uh, application on, on uh, maximization of free capacities in a gas network. Maybe I can uh, quickly rush through it if I have three minutes. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, here you see the, the gas network in, in Germany. Uh, it consists of uh, its nodes are, are subdivided into entries where you inject gas and exit where you exit where you withdraw gas for, for consumption. And, and then the mediator be between these two uh, sets of nodes is the gas network owner. And uh, his role is the following. He sells booking limits to customers at each node. So you can buy booking limits. The, the larger the booking limit, the more you pay. And this booking limit allows you now tomorrow and after tomorrow to nominate concrete values of the gas within these limits. Sometimes less, sometimes more, but all, always within these uh, limits. And uh, the gas network owner has to make sure that the transport, the physical transport from the entry nodes to the exit nodes uh, can be realized technically for any nomination of, of customers within their booking limits. And on the other hand, he is obliged by law to offer a maximum capacity which is remaining. Maybe he has uh, space left to offer more booking limits for new clients. And he has to find out uh, uh, how, much, uh, 
how much space is left there. Let me sketch it uh, in the situation of two exits, so we are two customers, and the set of feasible nominations which can be physically realized could be given by a set of inequalities like that. And maybe the existing uh, booking limits for the two customers are uh, give, given by these two intervals. So no, no matter how the two customers uh, nominate inside this uh, rectangle, uh, the network owner has to make sure that he can transport the gas there. Uh, on the other hand, he wants to find uh, um, additional capacities which are free to, offer to, to, to be offered to new clients. So it is clear how much he could offer in this setting. He could go until here and until here for the second node to, to reach the feasible limits, which corresponds to adding this small filled red circle to the original uh, rectangle, which is quite a small amount of additional uh, capacity he, he can offer on the market. But uh, he has a different idea because he observes from the historical data of the given clients that they never fill this rectangle uh, in a uniform way, but most nominations concentrate on a certain subregion. Let's say 99% of the nominations are in this green uh, uh, ellipsoid, and, but only very few exceptions go beyond and, and, and in very rare cases. And then, of course, he can have the idea of adding a capacity, a new capacity, where new customers can arbitrarily nominate in the new capacity, but add it to, to the uh, typical values of uh, nominations of the old uh, customers. And then you can see you can add a much bigger uh, rectangle in green here, and keeping, keeping the sum of this ellipsoid and this rectangle in the, in the feasible region. Of course, this is a probabilistic viewpoint. He no longer insists on uh, satisfying the, the, the sum of old, cli old clients' nominations and new client nominations uh, in an absolute uh, uh, meaning, but in a probabilistic meaning, let's say, let's say 99%. And what happens in the rare exceptions, it, it's up to him. He has some, uh, usually considers a, a steady state model uh, where he has some operational means uh, when, whenever violations take take place, he has some means to regulate for it, but it's outside the nomination uh, uh, question. And this leads, this leads to the following uh, optim capacity optimization problem. Um, X is the new, so it's a multi-dimensional interval, at each node you want to uh, offer new additional capacity for new clients, which can arbitrarily nominate why be between zero and this new capacity? Arbitrarily because you don't have any statistical information about new clients, but uh, uh, you have stati statistical information about the old clients, so you ask for choosing the free capacity uh, to be maximized in a way that the sum of old clients and new clients uh, in this uh, partially probabilistic and worst case uh, setting uh, uh, it can be technically realized with a probability uh, at least a little p. And I will not go into the detail how to describe technical uh, uh, feasibility. It uh, relies on first and second order Kirchhoff's law for pressure, pressure and flow in the gas network and uh, given pressure bounds along the pipes. And uh, in, a, in a certain paper with some colleagues, we, we were able to reduce these uh, implicit relations to explicit um, inequalities um, depending on the given loads in the, in the nodes. And uh, this uh, leads us to this uh, problem uh, where the probabilistic constraint is given by certain, by certain uh, quadratic uh, uh, inequalities in the random vector of the old client's nominations. And you see this partially probabilistic red and robust or semi-infinite blue uh, a setting of this inequality. You have to satisfy the technical feasibility for the sum for all new clients uh, nominations and with probability, let's say 95% with respect to the nomination behavior of, of the historical clients. And uh, in, in this setting, of course, you can see the, the index set is not even a constant. It is depending on the decision. So that's a, this is uh, inside this parenthesis, you have a, a, the setting of generalized semi-infinite 
uh, programming and it would be very hard to deal with it and we have some some first ideas with uh, with other colleagues how to attack that numerically but in this concrete application it turns out you can always uh, explicitly specify the worst case here this this means you can exactly for given for given xi you can exactly find the y depending on x which which is the worst here so that the whole system is satisfied and this gives an, an a, again a classical probabilistic constraint and using the, the tools with the gradients i explained uh, we were able to to solve this uh, this is just an example with one entry node and and many customers 26 exit nodes um, uh, assuming assuming a certain data for the problem it turns out in the given setting uh, 97, uh, the, the technical feasibility was 97%, but maybe 97% uh, is unnecessarily high and the, the network owner says, okay, it will be fine if it's 90% or 80, but, but with the hope to offer additional uh, capacity at, at these nodes for new clients. And so, for instance, if he reduces the desired probability to 95%, then these orange rings show you how much uh, additional capacity you can um, uh, offer in the network. It depends on the topology, it's, it's not uniform over the network. Further reducing leads to these extensions, which you can see here finally for 85%. You have a lot of uh, free capacity you can offer in these southern uh, exits, whereas uh, you are already at the limits uh, in, the, in the northeast. With this, I would like to uh, finish my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Oh no, this is uh, Antut, Abderim no, Antut. No, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, I, I think you are talking about the Mexican student, Tatiana Grandon. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, instead of considering the maximum or final number of functions, uh, they, uh, I, I see the difference, they consider infinitely many uh, functions. Yes. And so, the result, uh, the formula is much more involved, much more complicated, the uh, yes. they obtain in the repetitive patterns. Um, I, I think you're talking about the paper which is submitted with a, a French colleague, F uh, Wim van Akkoy, is it possible? No, you, you cited okay, it. let me see. Sorry, yeah. let, let me see, let, let us have a look. Yes, yes, this one, no? This one, not this one, not this one. Here, yes. Okay. Here. This one? No, 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 the following. The following? Here. Akkoy. This is, this is a French colleague. I'm sorry, not a, no, 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 that's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is right. Uh, they have uh, uh, Wim van Akkoy and, and uh, Pedro. Uh, they have a joint paper submitted where they uh, consider uh, uh, infinitely many uh, smooth constraints and under some additional technical uh, assumptions which, which are quite natural. You need something additional to avoid uh, uh, certain pathologies. They get basically exactly the same formula, but now in an infinite dimensional setting. So again, you have a critical index set. I think in your papers you call it capital T of X. Yeah. Yeah? And um, um, whenever this capital T of X is uh, um, more than a singleton, you have to take this convex hull over all these expressions. Yeah, so in principle, it's just for the purpose of a uh, more simpler, more easier uh, presentation that I yes. uh, cited this uh, no, already okay. published. This is generalization just uh, gave rise to something much more complicated or just in the same line? <laughs> well, of course, the ideas are similar behind, but the re realization is, is somehow technical. But it's very useful because Indeed, we are interested in infinite uh, uh, index sets uh, due to all these uh, potential applications in PDE constraint optimization, for instance, where you want to have uh, an inequality constraint to be satisfied over a whole domain. 
for all points of, a, of, of the domain. You, know, you could say, okay, instead of considering the whole domain, I, I pick 100 points, but this is not the same uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, my confusion comes uh, because after the, this uh, workshop in Chile, remember, there was a student of you, which I heard, that uh, working in, in Santiago with... Yes, the, this is a Mexican PhD student, and we have uh, other papers which I did not cite here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any other uh, question or comment? That we understood everything. Oh, that is my, the purpose of my talk. <laughs> uh, when you fix a probability P, uh, it is fixed all the time, or, or can you consider some parametric approach? You could do, yes. So usually it, it, it is fixed because the, in the application there may be some. For instance, for, for Electricité de France, there's some, by law, uh, some, some constraint that they have to fix a given demand at least with 95% uh, or 99% probability. And this they can relate to uh, interruptible contracts in order to keep with the exceptions. They have also the right to, to uh, uh, interrupt uh, supply of, uh, of power to other clients which accept uh, this interruption for getting lower uh, lower price uh, and so on and so on. So sometimes you you exactly know the probability level; it is fixed and given. Yeah. But often you don't know. Often you don't know, and and what you then do, of of course then you can can plot the optimal value depending on the safety level. Uh, the 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 larger the safety or the more the safety level approaches one. The, the costs will increase, so there will be first a, 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 sh a flat part of this cost function. You can increase a lot the safety without paying too much. This is my, this is my example here. 98%, uh, you, you lose a bit of profit, it's not, not that much, but if I would go to 99.6% maybe, uh, I, I would decrease my profit uh, drastically. And this would be a parametric. Um, approach but also what you what you what is often done is before applying uh, probabilistic constraints in, a, in an optimization problem you solve this reliability maximization this is you ignore your costs and you look for the largest probability you could achieve at all because if you do not know the largest probability which you can achieve at all it may happen you put some value here and the set is empty without you are aware of this fact the algorithm <laughs> runs uh, 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 without uh, reaching its goal ever and that is why uh, one uh, way to cope with it is to find the most robust decision which has nothing to do yet with your with your cost function but it gives you an idea what you can expect most and then you can uh, uh, minimize the cost subject to a constraint where the p is more or less uh, uh, substantially smaller than the largest uh, possible value. But all this dependence on the level is also interesting for uh, questions like duality and things like that. Um, but this was not in the focus of my work. Huh? So thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question or comments? Uh, if not, uh, thank you again. I thank you.